So I'm going to talk about an exquisite one next. It's called silk. It's what makes your mom's patu sarees from Kanjeevaram and your dad's Chinese silk tie. So you would have heard about this phrase, right? It's as smooth as silk. It's a very expensive, smooth fabric and also a really, really, really strong one. Because uh, why do I call it strong? Because the silk rope is actually stronger than an equally thick metal wire. But silk, it comes at a cost of a life. The life of a silkworm. It's made a bit cruelly. So there's this whole industry surviving because of silk. The cultivation is called sericulture. Now the tiny eggs of the silkworm moth are incubated till they hatch into something called larva. At this point, the larva is about a quarter of an inch long. Remember the size, it's really, really important. Just a quarter of an inch. Now once they are hatched, the larva is placed under a fine gauze layer and fed huge amount of chopped mulberry leaves during which time they actually shed their skin four times. Uh, the larvae which feed on mulberry leaves produce the finest of the finest silk. The larva will eat 50,000 times its initial weight in plant material. So for about six weeks, the silkworm eats continuously and grows to a maximum size of three inches at six weeks. Then it stops eating, changes color and is about 10,000 times heavier than when it's hatched. The silkworm is now ready to spin a silk cocoon. A single silkworm pupa can produce up to 15 meters of fiber per minute. So the silkworm attaches itself to a compartmented frame, a twig, a tree, a shrub in a, in a rearing house to spin a silk cocoon over a three to eight day period. This period is called pupating and steadily over the next four days, silkworm will rotate its body in a figure eight movement 300,000 times, constructing a cocoon and producing about a kilometer of silk filament. So now we need to reel out this filament and this is when we get to the cruel part. The cocoon is treated with hot air, steam or boiling water. The silk is then unbound from the cocoon by delicately and carefully unwinding or reeling these filaments from four to eight cocoons at one time, sometimes with a slight twist to create a single strand. So this is how it's actually done. Now the amount of usable silk in each cocoon, if you ask me, it's really, really, really small because it takes 10 kgs of cocoon to obtain one kg of silk. Oh, and a silk dress requires about 70 kgs of mulberry tree leaves. So lot, lot of raw material going into that silk dress. So the Chinese were the first to discover the use of silk. It was a closely guarded secret by them for over a thousand years. In fact, the earliest evidence of silk was found at the sites of the Yangshao culture in Xia County, Sanghi, where a silk cocoon was found cut up in half by a sharp knife dating back, you know, 4,000 to 3,000 BCE. This species was identified as the Bombay Smori. Now from the Chinese, the secret spread to the Koreans, the Japanese and the Indians. And that's how mom's Pattu Sari came into existence. So the whole discovery of silk has some interesting fairy tale stories. So let's just get into one of them. A long, long time ago in the 27th century BCE, a silkworm's cocoon fell into the teacup of the Empress Li Zhu. She wanted to remove it from her drink. How did she do that? The 14-year-old empress began to unroll the thread of the silk cocoon. She then had an idea. Hey, let's weave it. And voila, she had beautiful dresses made. And having observed the life of the silkworm on the recommendation of her husband, the yellow emperor, she began to instruct, you know, her entourage in the art of raising silkworms what we now, you know, call sericulture. Now, from this point, the girl became the goddess of silk in Chinese mythology. Silk eventually left China on the air of a princess who was promised to a prince, the prince of Khotan. This happened in the early first century, you know, AD. The princess, she actually refused to go without the fabric that she loved so much. And she would be the very first one who would finally break the ban on silkworm exportation, which was there for centuries in China. Now, the sensitive ones among you are really feeling bad for the silkworms, maybe wondering, is there an alternative to this? Scientists those days wondered too. 
but their inventions has actually nothing to do with people feeling bad for silkworms it has more to do with two things one the sky rocketing high prices of silk and two a disease which hit the silkworms in the 1860s french silk industry was being threatened by a disease affecting the silkworm as i mentioned in the 1860s louis pasteur and count hilaire de chardonnay so these two people were studying this problem with the hope of saving this vital and high money making industry and during this crisis chardonnay became interested in finding a way to produce what we now call and know as artificial silk rayon 